I'm Hartwig Fisher, director of the British Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Era of Reclamation talk. I invited Bonnie Greer to curate a project, and together we identify reclamation as a prevalent theme of our era. This is also an opportunity to listen and to learn as we move towards the great transformation of the British Museum. There's a lot of stuff to ask you. I mean, you're in a besieged city, um, the capital of the United States of America, which was uh, almost sacked by a, a marauding mob who basically made up a white supremacist and anti-government people. Something that you know as an historian has always been a part of the United States. It's nothing new. They just came out of the woodwork this time. Um, I just have one question. Um, I got two. Um, what moment are we in now, Lonnie? Where, where are we? What's, what's, what's happening? Not only in the United States, but in the world right now, as you see it. You know, where we are is an amazing moment. We're at a time of loss. We're at a time of anger. We're at a time of racial conflict. We're at a time where people attack the government in a way that no one ever thought would ever happen. Um, and that in essence, we're at a time of crisis. But we're at a time also where I think this is where cultural institutions are at their best. We're at a time where cultural institutions should be the glue that holds countries, communities together. The cultural institutions like museums ought to be the place that contextualizes the challenges but that brings understanding so that we have people who are trying to understand where we are. We have the information and we have the trust to do that. Where we are, are at a moment that I never thought I'd see on so many levels. A moment where I never thought I'd see um, African-Americans playing a, such a large role, um, Secretary of Defense, the Vice President. But we're also at a place where issues of race are crucially important in the United States. And so much of what you saw in the attack on the Capitol was about race, was about white supremacy. But we're also at a place globally where now people around the world are asking, how do I reclaim my full identity? How do I claim my identity as being African descended, for example, but how do I claim my British identity? So in essence, this is a real time where you either have a moment of transformation or it's going to be a moment of frustration and concern. And rage, and rage. Lonnie, I talk about frustration, and this is a kind of generational frustration on my part. Um, you know, you and I are the same, you know, the same age. Our fathers uh, were served in this country, in the United Kingdom, in a segregated army. Now we've got an African-American man as head of the military, which our fathers would never have. You know, you could even tell them that this would ever happen. But having said that, um, you know, I've worked with Fred Hampton uh, for a minute in the Black Panther Party. You know Chicago very well as, as, a, as the head of the Chicago Historical Society, another first that you did, which is, if anybody knows Chicago, would have been unthinkable when we were children <laughs> that a Black man headed up that. That, that august institution. We went through a lot of things. And now I see the younger people in the Black Ma Lives Matter movement, which I call Black Lives Matter too. Um, mm -hmm. How come it's, I'm sitting there listening to them saying the same things we said in the streets the same way we were, uh, in the stuff we're going through. How do museums talk about this? in a way well, that they get the link. Well, I think you've put your finger on what is a real issue. In many countries, especially the United States, we're ahistorical, right? That uh, every generation feels they're reinventing the wheel. And that in essence, part of the role of 
cultural institutions, part of the role of people that care about history, whether it's on television, in theater, in museums, the role is to make sure those stories are told in a way that isn't sort of, you know, old people saying, oh, we knew how to do this, but rather to say that, one, the challenge for fairness, the challenge for equality in any country is an eternal process. That in essence, you don't get to the promised land. What you do is get to way stations on the way to the promised land. And that what you want is people to be able to not be held captive by the past, but to understand the traditions, understand the ideas, understand the tactics, and then make that work for a new generation. But don't believe that there hasn't been change, and don't believe that there haven't been people on whose shoulders you stand. And I think the challenge for us all is to recognize how do we help new generations understand they are standing on amazing shoulders, that there has been loss, there has been strategy, there has been gain. And that now the goal is push us forward. As I rarely quote Thomas Jefferson, but he was right. He said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Just thinking about my experience of visiting the National uh, Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, it is, as you say, creating a place where your story, your stories can be told and can be heard and can be appreciated as a key contribution to the community or the entire country you live in, your family has been living in, and that to whose success you've contributed. I think it's more, if I remember, um, you know, I, I went back several times to that museum because it really, it blew my mind. You know, the, the, the museum you have created, um, with the help of communities across the country is a place of representation. And I think when we talk about reclamation, when we talk about feeling that you are a valued member of the community whose voice is being heard, museums as places of representation play a very important part. I think that's really important. I think what you've really put your finger on is what I argue is the change that has to happen in museums. I've always felt that I became a better historian when I began to work with the living community, right? Rather than sort of be distant. And that I believe that museums are made better when they recognize that their job in some ways is to fit the museum to the needs of the community. And when I thought about building the National Union of African American History and Culture, I thought about it through several different lenses. One was that this was a museum that was going to be on the National Mall. And for those who don't know it, the National Mall is where the symbols of America, the Capitol, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Smithsonian. And I thought just being on that mall changes the discourse. So much of the mall was white marble. And suddenly here's a building that a little bit of color to it um, that basically said, there has always been a dark presence in America that often gets underlooked or undervalued. Now it's here. But then the next step was to say, how do you make sure this is a story for us all? Because I've argued, the one thing I've learned is that the story of Black America is in some ways the quintessential American story. It's the story that helps us understand the best of America and the worst of America. It's the story that has shaped every aspect of American life. And so what I wanted was I wanted people of African descent to say they're home. I wanted them to feel that this was who they were. But I wanted everybody to recognize this is your story too. That all of us, regardless of race, regardless of how long we've been in the United States, all of us have been shaped by and made better by the African-American experience. Museums are part of that process, of that continuous process of addressing your past, of facing your past, in all, in all its contradictions, in its violent parts, as well as its, in its humane and um, humanitarian parts. If you like. um, and I think when you say open the veil, then Lonnie, it is also about speaking about 
the the creation of the museums, the development of the museums, yeah. and how they've collected um, the world. And I think I think that is so important. I think you've really put your finger on an issue. Um, what I'm trying to do with the Smithsonian is to revisit how the Smithsonian has interpreted race throughout its history. Has it been a symbol sometimes for anti-racism, but often for racism? Um, I think in some ways we can't model what we expect from the public if we don't look at ourselves and ask those hard questions. And that's tough, but I think it's really powerful. I mean, when I became secretary of the Smithsonian, it was really important for me to, to tell a story. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, um, was somebody that everybody wanted to hear from. In the 19th century, the Smithsonian Castle, the central old building, had the largest auditorium in Washington and it brought amazing speakers to come talk about civil war and the science. Um, and Frederick Douglass was never invited in. And at one point, the head of the Secretary, Secretary of the Smithsonian said, no African-American should speak at this great, great auditorium. So when I became secretary, the first thing I said was, Frederick Douglass is now speaking at the Smithsonian. And so in a way, being able to deal with who we once were is crucial to helping us become the institutions that we need to, to serve this complicated, diverse audiences that now expect much more from us and rightly so. I think, you know, as museums reach for new audiences, as museums ask different questions, it is a challenge. It's a challenge to staff. It's a challenge to traditional funders and supporters but it also is the key to being that place of value. I keep coming back to that notion. Um, every museum, every country's museums think about value in different ways and that's okay. As long as they recognize that their goal is to find ways through education, through illumination, through a sense of wonder, to find ways to help make a city, a region, a nation better.